Hey guys, welcome to our continuation of this class called The Story, Finding Your Place in God's Story as we walk through the entire story of Scripture. When you think about the way people view God, he's often viewed as this super soft grandfather, this benevolent gentleman with a long beard whose primary job is to be nice, or perhaps he looks something like this and is so kind as Morgan Freeman portrays him in uh, the Evan Almighty movies. And that's how people view God sometimes. Catherine the Great once said that God is good. He's bound to forgive us. That's his job. And you can imagine when you view God just as this grandfatherly figure, the way that that's going to affect your relationship with him. On the opposite side of that, God is sometimes viewed through the spectrum of deism, as if he is a far-off being that created the world in all of his glorious power, but now has nothing to do with it. Sometimes he's described in deism as a God who wound up the entire universe like an old-fashioned watch, and it's now running down without any input from him. Uh, it's doing its own thing. When God is just a super soft grandfather, or you view him as just some far-off God as deism does, you can imagine the impact that has on the way we view him. Now, both of those views have some truth. God is big and glorious as deism portrays him. But he's also personal, and he's interested in our affairs, and he communicates with us. He's loving, but he's holy. He's angry about sin, but he's gracious. So both have some truth in them. Throughout the history of the world, some have had a relationship with God or viewed a relationship with God or the gods as kind of mutual back-scratching. That's what polytheism does. You sacrifice to the gods in hopes that they will protect you and bless you. And at times we're guilty of this. We think, okay, we serve God or we do good things for the purpose of getting good things in response. It's a lot like karma and presupposes that God has these needs from us. And if this is God, then well, we serve him so that he'll serve us in essence. In Acts chapter 17, in Paul's sermon on Mars Hill, watch how God is described in verses 24 and 25. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. From this passage, Carson notes that there are three things you'll learn. Number one, God cannot be manipulated. You can't serve him so that then he'll serve you. God does not need us. We don't put him in a temple so that we can serve him because he needs us to serve him. And again, um, idolatrous religions have often viewed God in this way. God, The gods need us to serve them, and so you put a bunch of priests in a temple so they can serve the, the God or the God's that are in that temple. God doesn't need us. Rather, we need him. So God is not just some far off God, though he is glorious. He's not some soft hearted grandfather. He's, he's distant, but he does love us. We don't have any way that we can make a deal with God by what we do for him because he can't be manipulated. The only way you can have a relationship with the kind of God that's described in the Bible is if he displays his grace to us. That's it. That's the only way we can have a, a relationship with an all-powerful creator God. In fact, in our study so far, we've talked about this all powerful creator God as we've begun to walk through this story of who God is in all of scripture. We began with the very beginning and talked about this God who creates everything from nothing. But then disaster occurs. The fall occurs in chapter three when this creation rebels. So what's this God who's created all things, including human beings, going to do when his creation rebels against him? And last week we saw that he doesn't destroy them. He doesn't wipe out the rebels. But in this third part, after we leave Genesis chapter 3, in Genesis chapter 4 through 11, it's just one disaster after another. It is rebellion after rebellion. So how is God going to have a relationship with his people, with his creation, when they continue to rebel with him? And the answer is he's going to make covenants with these people. He's going to write his own agreements with these people. Now, as I've said from the very beginning of this study, um, I am leaning very heavily um, on the God who is there. In fact, I'm kind of studying through this book. Uh, it's a great way, I think, to walk through Scripture and get the whole story of Scripture. So what I'm going to share with you today in all these classes comes from D.A. Carson's book, The God Who Is There, and the structure of this and the content as well. 
let's jump in to this third part of our study, the story, our walk through Scripture, which is a discussion of, of covenants. So what, what is a covenant? Um, there are differences between a modern covenant or contract um, and the covenants or contracts in the Bible. The biggest difference is that when we enter into a covenant or a contract with somebody today, um, we both work on it together. Um, it's negotiated by both parties. In Scripture, as you read about the covenants, um, there's, no, there's no negotiation. Um, God gives these covenants down. It was it's top down. God writes the agreements in his in his own covenants. And what's amazing is that his grace is superbly display, displayed, beautifully displayed in these in these covenants that we don't negotiate with them that he writes but are very very gracious. And I want to show you three that you find in the very early stages of scripture. And we're going to start with Genesis chapter 12. So Genesis chapter 12, here in a minute I'm going to have you read some on your own from Genesis 22 and Genesis 17. But Genesis 12 we can read together this first covenant that God sets up with Abraham. Verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great. So that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, as with a covenant, um, there are two sides to it, right? So God makes a promise, and there are conditions to that promise. So Abram is called to leave his family, to leave his country, and go to the place where God has called him. And if he does that, God would bless him in very significant ways. Now, the promises are, if you do this, Abraham... I'll make you a great nation. Your name will be great. I'm going to bless those who bless you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is an early, early prophecy that points to Jesus. Since Jesus is the seed of Abraham, comes from the bloodline of Abraham, it would ultimately be through Jesus that God would bless all the people on the earth through, through Jesus. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul actually mentions this. Galatians 3 verses 8 and 9. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you all the nations will be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Isn't that cool that Paul says God preached the gospel to Abraham? Clear back in Genesis chapter 12 when he says, Listen, it's through you, Abraham, that every nation will be blessed. And that's ultimately through Jesus that we, the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, get to partake in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Now the next covenant comes in Genesis chapter 17. So what I want you to do is read Genesis chapter 17, 1 to 10. And as you read this, I want you to ask what's, what's in this covenant, um, what does it depend on? Alright, so Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 10. So hopefully you've read that and you see some of the promises that God makes to Abraham. So he says, if you walk before me and you're blameless, um, I'm going to make you the father of a multitude of nations. I'm gonna, you're going to be exceedingly fruitful. I will make you into nations. Uh, kings will come to you. We're going to have this everlasting covenant. I'm going to be your God. Uh, they'll have this the land, the everlasting possession. Um, and I'm going to be their God. So there's just all these incredible promises. And it's based on what Abraham does. Verse 9, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring, and after you throughout their generations, this is the covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. So here, circumcision comes into the picture as Abraham's part in this covenant with God. If Abraham and his family and his descendants will continue to practice this rite or this tradition, God's going to continue to bless them. So, this covenant depends on, all covenants depend on, right, the fulfillment of both sides, right? So Abraham must be faithful to this covenant, Abraham and his descendants, the circumcision, and you go back to verse, verse 1, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between you. So both sides have to fulfill their promises. The problem is, and what's amazing about these covenants that God makes Abraham's descendants were never consistently obedient to God. Let that sink in. God fulfills these promises and these covenants, but Abraham and his people and his descendants continually, continually rebel against God. Abraham is going to sin. 
Isaac, his son, is a wimp in many ways. The next son, Jacob, he he does some good things in the long haul, but he's a trickster and a deceiver all the way through. Jacob ends up having 12 sons. One of them sleeps with his father's concubine. Another sleeps with his daughter-in-law. Ten of them try to decide whether they're going to um, murder the 11th brother or sell him into slavery. And these are the patriarchs of Israel. And so it's amazing that in spite of their unfaithfulness to the covenant, God still doesn't wipe them out and in many ways still keeps the covenant with them and blesses them in significant ways. Let me show you one more covenant that God makes with his people, and that's in Genesis chapter 22. Now I want you to, to read these. I want you to stop the video and read this on your own. Verses 1 all the way down through 11 or so, 1 through 10, I guess you could say, tell the story of God asking Abraham to take his only son Isaac, um, his special son Isaac, and sacrifice him. So read Genesis chapter 22, 1 to 10, and then I want you to read verses 11 through 18, where another covenant occurs. All right, so pause the video, read Genesis 22, uh, verses 1 down through 19. Now, this is a a well-known story, and if you've been around church very long, you've read the story of God um, asking Isaac or Abraham to sacrifice his son. But it leaves us with some weird questions, like this one. What kind of God would want someone to sacrifice their children, right? Well, what, kind of, what kind of God asks his people to do that? The pagan gods, right? Basically, what God is saying to Abraham is, listen, those, those pagans, they, they trust their gods enough, their murderous gods, their false gods, to sacrifice their children to them. That's how, that's how much they trust their gods. Do you trust me? Here's the thing. I provide the sacrifice. You can't please me by sacrificing your son. I offer the sacrifice. I provide the sacrifice. And throughout all the story of Scripture, what is God going to do? He's going to provide the sacrifice. You can't manipulate me through your sacrifices. I'm the one who offers the sacrifice. So do you trust me? Now, what do you do with Genesis chapter 22 today? What does it tell us about God? I think it tells us this, and I'm paraphrasing Carson here. God doesn't demand that we sacrifice our children. He didn't demand that of Abraham in this case either. In grace, he provides a sacrifice, and what he wants from us is to turn wholly to him and say, in effect, you are God, you are Lord, you are sovereign, I am dependent upon you, I need you, I will trust you, and I will obey you. That's what the God who writes his own covenants asks us to do. He asks us to follow him simply because we trust him. We trust that he'll fulfill his side of the covenant. Now, there's multiple things I think you learn about God from these covenant relationships he has. I think one of the things is this. We learn about the goodness and initiative of God in dealing with his rebellious image bearers. I mean, think about it. If somebody consistently rebels against you, are you going to reach out to that person and try to set up some sort of agreement or relationship with that person? Well, no, we'll avoid that person. But it's God who reaches out and says, listen, even though you're going to continue to rebel against me and you have rebelled in me against me, I'm willing to take the initial step. I'm willing to write these agreements to set them up and then by grace extend them to you. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that God still sets up his covenant relation, offers a covenant relationship with us, just like he did with Abraham and the patriarchs? Even though they rebelled against him over and over again and kept messing up, he continued that covenant relationship with them. Isn't it amazing that still today, God writes his own agreement, sets up this covenant through his son, Jesus, and by the blood of Jesus and through his grace, he continues to offer this gracious sacrifice to us through Jesus Christ. And it's all grounded in who he is as a good and faithful God. So how should we respond to this kind of a God? I think it's simple. We respond to a God that offers this kind of grace with dependence, trust, and obedience. A dependence that says, God, I can't... I can't give you anything you need. I need you completely. 
and I trust you to fulfill your side of the promise, your part of the covenant. And so because of what you've done for me, I'm going to obey you because of who you are. I don't deserve it, but because of who you are, I will depend on you, I will trust you, and I will obey you. And that is part three of the story as we find our place in God's story as we walk through the whole story of Scripture. Thanks for joining us.